Let me greet you all this morning in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. It is a privilege to share the Word of God with you and also to see the faces that we have not seen in a long while. So welcome back and uh, we pray that uh, the Lord has enriched you and blessed you and showed you his goodness and kindness uh, when you were away. We're taking a break from 1 Corinthians this morning, our first break, but we're going to look at Revelation chapter 2. So in your copy of God's Word, then turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Our text will be from verse 1 to verse 7, where we will hear the Lord pouring out his heart to us, his church. Here then, God speak to us from his word. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? This is what the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says, <coughs> I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot bear with those who are evil. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake. You also have not grown weary. <coughs> but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds that you did at first. But if not, I am coming to you and will remove from your lampstand. I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have written personally to your church. This is your love letter to the church. Lord, it is what you want us to hear from your word this morning. So we pray, Lord, that you would use your word to revive us, to convict us, to convert the unconverted. And to help us, Lord, see why you have called us as your people and your church and why you have planted us in this place, in this city. So help us, therefore, Lord, to take in your word and write its eternal truths on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul says the following about speaking the truth to one another in love he says by speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head that is Christ from whom the whole body being joined and held together by what every joint supplies according to the properly measured working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of self of itself in love for a relationship to grow strong or relationships to go strong as believers, we need to always share truths with one another, speaking the truth all the time. And at times it may be difficult to speak the truth, but we need to speak the truth and being kind and gentle every time we tell one another truths. If we love one another, our relationships then will always be characterized by us speaking the truth to one another. The truth about doctrine, truth about the gospel, and truth about the health of our relationships. And if we do not speak truth to one another, then we will fail to train one another to grow in the truth and to mature. And if we do not speak the truth to one another, then we are deceiving ourselves. For example, when asked by someone, who loves you how you are doing and they genuinely care and want to know how you are doing and if you know that you're not well but then miss the opportunity that God is granting you through that person to help you and then you say that you are well you are deceiving that person and deceiving 
yourself. You're not telling the truth. If you see something or an offense in someone, the Bible says that you should go to that person and tell them their fault. If they have offended you, tell them their fault and pray for that person to repent instead of pretending that all is well and pretending that the relationship is healthy and miss the opportunity to build a healthy or cultivate a healthy relationship. Healthy relationships, the Apostle Paul says, grow towards maturity and we help one another. We cultivate the growth. We speak truth to one another because people need truths to grow. When you speak the truth, you show care. And in order for you to, for example, when you counsel someone to help that person, you have to tell them the truth because in a counseling situation, you're not going to be helpful to whoever you're counseling if you don't tell them the truth. When people are doing well, we have to commend them. Speak the truth and don't be jealous and commend people who are doing well. We must speak the truth even when we condemn something that is not okay. Not hurtful, not being hurtful, but speaking the truth to help whoever should be condemned on action that should be condemned in a person. And this is the way of the Lord. The, lo the way of the Lord which is the love way. And God did not deceive us when he saved us. He told us the truth about our hearts. He told us the truth about our sins. He told us the truth about our depravity. He told us that we are not good people. And in doing so, the Lord saved us by telling us the truth, the truth that set us free. And throughout our Christian walk, we will always have to hear difficult things. And we should not shy away from hearing difficult things from people who love us, who tell us difficult things that we need to hear. We need to continually hear difficult things in order for us to grow. Don't be easily offended if someone points out something that you need to repent of. Repent and make things right without delay. And this is how the Lord prunes us in order for us to produce righteous fruit by telling us the truth. And such is the case then in our text this morning. I made an application last week and the reason why I took a break from First Corinthians First Corinthians is because of that application that I made, that we love the Lord Jesus Christ at the point of our conversion. But then as time goes, we lose the first love that we had for the Lord Jesus Christ. And after I said that, I felt the Lord impressing it on my heart to, to go to this text in Revelation chapter 2 to encourage us and to challenge us to recapture the first love that we had for the Savior at the time we became Christians. And this text and this love letter, as I titled the sermon, the, the Lord's love letter to the church, we find four aspects, four aspects to this love letter that the Lord Jesus Christ has written to us to ponder. He wants us to think about these things that he says in this letter so that we may recapture our first love. Four aspects to this love letter that the Lord Jesus Christ has written to us so that we can think about it, ponder, remember as we, as we heard in the text, to remember the deeds that we did at first to recapture our first love. <coughs> the first aspect then to ponder is the Lord's care in verse 1. And the second is the Lord's commend commendation because he commands the Christians, the believers, in verse 2, verse 3, and verse 6. And the third aspect is the Lord's concern. In verse 4, he says, but I have this against you, raising a concern. And then lastly, in verse 5 and verse 6, we see the Lord's correction, as he corrects the believers and corrects us. But let us firstly then consider the Lord's care for the church, the Lord's care for us as Free State Bible Church. In verse 1, then, we have an instruction 
And in this instruction, we see the Apostle John instructed to write by this person that we're going to consider in a moment. But this person then tells the Apostle John to write to the angel of the church. And he tells them what to write. And the, what, what he was to write will be the following contents that we find from verse 1 to verse 7. But look at who is speaking then, this one, the one who instructs John to write. He describes himself as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven lambs stands. He's already fully described for us in chapter 1, even though we did not read. But if we turn back to chapter 1, we will see who this is. And in chapter 1 from verse 12, we read about him. This one who holds the seven stars in his hand, the one who walks among the seven lampstands. Let us see who this is. John says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw the seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and gathered across his chest with a golden sash. And his head and his hair were like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like banished bronze, when it had been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And having in his right hand the seven stars and a sharp two-edged sword which, which comes out of his mouth. And his face was like the sun shining in its power. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not fear, I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. I'm not going into the details about the description of this one, but I think it's fairly clear and obvious who this is. The one who, was, who, was, who died, who rose, and is alive forever and ever can only be one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. But firstly, observe then, the seven golden lampstands in verse 20 of chapter 1. We are told there by John in verse 20 that as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands and there's the interpretation of what these seven lampstands are. The seven stars are the angels of the churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The lampstand is the church. The oils of the lampstand, where we're told that they are, or, or, or lampstands in, in the first century were, were like lamps, like this light that we have here, that was used to shine light in the darkness, as we have light that shines in the darkness today. And they were golden because they were used of something that was very precious, gold. Gold was precious then, as gold is precious today and so the lord says that the church is the light of the world of the world the lampstand and also the church is precious like gold is precious and that's what the lord says the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches who are the leaders of the churches and then we are told that christ holds in his right hand the stars, the ministers of the gospel, preachers, pastors, elders, are held by Christ in his right hand. And when ministers then of the gospel preach the gospel, they minister under the authority of Christ, but not only under the authority of Christ, but with the authority of Christ, because Christ speaks through his servants. And then John then tells us that Jesus was like the Son of Man, this one that he saw walking among the many churches. And the reference to the Son of Man comes from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And the reference there means Messiah, because Daniel speaks about the one who will come, who is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, 
God himself, but coming like the Son of Man, in humility, yet exalted, sovereign, and powerful. And Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man in the Gospels. But his presence in chapter 1, from verse 12 to verse 18, is described to us in his splendor, that Christ is walking among the churches in his splendor, in his authority. He is present here this morning. Christ forever walks among his churches. And in the letter that he writes, in the words that he wants us to hear this morning, don't miss the fact that Christ is here. He's walking among us. And he's examining everything. And on top of that, he has a message for us. He says to the churches, write. He says to John, write. Write to the pastors who will deliver the message to the churches. And I wanted to highlight an important aspect here that Christ says, write to my church. And to be called a church by the Lord Jesus Christ is a big deal. Not every gathering in this world, not even those who, are, who gather under the pretext of calling themselves Christians are worthy of being called a church of Christ. When Christ says, my church, then he means his true church, not any gathering that professes to be Christ's church. And then in verse 9 of chapter 2, we see the Lord Jesus Christ expressing his opinion about those who, who call themselves his people, the Jews who, who gather saying they were a synagogue of Christ. He says that they are a synagogue of Satan. So Jesus is not afraid of saying those who gather not under my name, but saying they gather under my name are synagogues of Satan. But to this church in Ephesus, he says, this is my church. And the same applies to many who are gathered even this morning in our country, or those who gather around the world who say that they are churches of Christ but are not. But to be called a church of Christ, and even to be called a Christian, is a lofty thing. And Christ is serious about calling a church his church. And Christ is very serious about saying, those who are in that church, the Christians, are my people. And so when Christ writes this love letter to his people, it's very important for us to note. But first, let's start with what being a Christian is. To be a Christian, then, one must be a convert, and you must bear the marks of genuine conversion. There must be signs to show that you're a Christian, fruit in keeping with repentance to show that you are truly a Christian. You can't be a Christian because you identify as one. You must be born again to be a Christian. You must be a new creation, a work only God can do. You don't have to merely profess that you are if you're not. There should be evidence in your life that you are a Christian. Don't say you're a Christian because your parents are Christian. Don't say you're a Christian because it is a religion that your family assigned to you. Don't say you're a Christian only to mean that you identify with Christians and not with other religions. And of course, Christianity makes sense. Christianity makes sense more than Buddhism. Christianity makes sense more than Islam. Christianity makes sense more than African traditional religion. But don't profess to be a Christian because you find it more attractive than those religions. You must be a Christian to be a Christian. Christians are people who are united to the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible is very clear about who Christians are. They are those whom God has chosen from before the beginning of the world. They are justified by faith alone and sanctified by the Holy Spirit of Christ alone. They have repented of their sins and are children of God who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit permanently. But most importantly, again, Christians are members of churches of Christ. Conrad Mbewe says you can't be a Christian and not belong to a church. 
and I've said it many times, I agree with that statement. Because in the New Testament, you will never find a person calling themselves a Christian who was not a member of a church. Because you don't have witnesses. Christ says here in the passage that we read, remember, he holds the keys of death and Hades. Death and eternal life. And Christ has given those keys to the church. The keys of the kingdom of heaven are given to the church. The church is the only institution in the world that has the authority to bind and to lose, to accept people into the church and to excommunicate those who refuse to repent of their sins. The church is the only institution in the world that Christ has given the power to identify who Christians are who belong with them. If you don't have that witness in your life, you can't call yourself a Christian. Christians are those who love the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with all their hearts, mind, body, and soul. Christians are those who love God because they want to have a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the ones that Jesus wrote this letter to, this letter that we are studying. Christ wrote it to Christians, only those that he can identify as his church. And not only that, the church is loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing that Jesus loves more than the church in this world. There's nothing that God uses to spread the gospel than churches. Only the church has been given the authority by Christ to spread the gospel, to propagate the gospel in the world. Listen to some of the, th the, the lofty things that some authors have said about the church and see how precious and how God cares for the church and how God loves the church and values the church. John Stott says, the church lies at the very center of the eternal purpose of God. MacDever says, the church is the body of people called by God's grace through faith in Christ to glorify him together by serving him in this world. And Conrad Bewer says, the church is a gathering of those who have been called out of the sinful world for salvation and who have made a covenant with each other to care for each other and to assemble regularly to worship God. Those who have made a covenant with each other to assemble regularly and to worship together. If you do not have people that you have made a covenant with to assemble together with regularly and worship together with, you cannot call yourself a Christian. And some of the passages that these men have relied on for the description of the church and why the church is so precious to Christ are in some of the most important passages of scripture. The first one is Acts chapter 20 verse 28, which by the way is the, you know, it's where we get the motto for Hope uh, for Christed Bible Church. In Acts chapter 20 verse 28, there the apostle Paul says, be on guard for yourselves and for the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. In simple terms then, interpretation, when Jesus died on the cross, he was dying only for the church. Nothing else, no one else. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 to verse 11, again, Paul says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. The only foundation that there is from God is Christ. And that foundation is what the, 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 the foundation upon which the church is built. And then Paul again in 1 Timothy chapter, 5, chapter 3 verse 15 says, The church is the household of God, the household of the living God, 
the pillar and support of the truth. So even though Jesus then in our passage, if we go back to Revelation chapter 2, even though Jesus in our passage is going to, to correct the church in verse 4 and verse 5 and verse 7, he's going to correct the church. He's going to condemn the church. He identifies this church as a gathering of believers who have been saved by faith and are united to him. He recognizes that these people are his church. He does not say that they are no longer a church. He does not say that they are no longer Christians. But he's showing them so much care by reminding them that he has purchased them with his own blood, by referring to this Ephesian church as a church. So Christ then shows us his care in this letter that he writes to us. And as I said, in the or next week, rather, we look at the other three aspects of the love, Lord's love letter to us so that as a church we may evaluate ourselves and see how we ought to, to serve Christ. But again in verse 2, when we look at the commendation, we will see that Jesus says, I know you. That's the first thing that he begins to say. Remember, he's walking among us. And then he says in verse 2, I know you. I know your deeds. The Lord knows everything there is to know about you. The Lord knows everything there is to know about this church. The Lord knows everything there is to know about any church. The Lord has a perfect, most intimate knowledge about the good and the bad of our lives, the good and the bad of our church. And what he says to us here, we can take with all our hearts as the Lord telling us what he thinks about us. And what we ought to do then is to repent because those who have ears to hear will follow the Lord, will obey the Lord. And it is my prayer then for us as we look at the other aspects of the letter that will respond uh, to what the Lord has to say to us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we hear you are speaking to us. Your word is infallible, inerrant, authoritative, sufficient. Lord, you said these words many years ago, but they're still applicable to us. So Lord, as we have seen how you care about us, help us then, Lord, to be those who regard ourselves as mere sinners who are saved by grace and are plucked into this church to save you, to be light to the world. We were formerly darkness ourselves. We walked in the dark. We did evil things. We did the nasty, not recognizing your authority and your judgment that is looming. But in your grace and mercy and kindness, you saved us. So Lord, when you write to us to correct us, to call us to think and to remember the deeds we did at first, how Lord, we have now left the first love, we pray Lord that you would help us as your people to genuinely examine ourselves and not to resist what you, the Spirit has to say to us. So we pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts and be with us the rest of the week as we think about the truths of your word. Amen.